Hi, I'm Doug Draper. I'm the host of Uptime Logistics. I'm with Denver Transportation Club and Uptime Logistics is powered by Cap Logistics. Today we have a phenomenal guest, Jim Witt. Jim, I'd like to welcome you. Um, Jim is with uh, Purpose Unlimited. Uh, he's also an author, uh, producer, and done about anything you can think of uh, related to, to the media. Uh, today we're going to be talking about water, uh, um, how that impacts farming and agriculture in, in general. So we're excited about, uh, about the topic. But before we jump into it, we really like to learn a little bit more about our guest. And so, Jim, I'm going to turn it over to you. Tell us about yourself, kind of some of the business ventures you've been involved with, and of course, uh, Purpose Unlimited, which is your current, uh, uh, current venture happening right now. Okay. Well, what launched me into my business in 1988 was the discovery of my purpose, which is to help people reach their full potential. And uh, that was the beginning of what we call Purpose Unlimited today. So our a whole organization is about transforming organizations, transforming people's lives, transforming the world. That's really what we want to do. And uh, the key to that is purpose. Uh, I come from an agricultural background and uh, I grew up in Osage County in Oklahoma, uh, you know, where we were in the cattle business or the oil business or a business that served the, the cattle or the oil business. So that's where my background comes from. I have a degree in animal science and there aren't very many management consultants that have degrees in animal science. So that gave me a natural niche in agriculture. And uh, I spent several years working for the Ralston Purina Company after I graduated from college in the High Plains uh, which borders right up against Colorado state line there. And uh, because of that, I, I really got in by, uh, involved in, in large scale agriculture and found out just how critical water was. And because of that, I've been involved in water, agriculture, just all things ag ever since then. Still am, even though I'm not directly involved in it, I, I work with people and consult with organizations that are. Mm -hmm. Great. And uh, we found out earlier that we're both graduates of Big 12 institutions. So uh, I'm glad that the Big 12 is moving forward with football this season. So we'll, we'll meet each other. Oklahoma State and Kansas will we'll, uh, we'll tackle each other literally here in a, in a couple of weeks. So we hope I so. really, what's that? <laughs> we hope so. I know, I know. <laughs> But that's always a nice connection to share. So I appreciate it. Um, so let's kind of jump into, you know, you hear about water management and agriculture and things like that. So it's kind of a broad topic. Uh, we're going to dive deeper um, here in, in a few minutes. But when people refer to the topic of water management as it relates to agriculture, maybe you could define that for us a little bit. Maybe that'd be a good place to start. Well, water management, if you go to the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, I think they define it as the... Uh, the movement and use of water with, uh, to maximum benefit uh, without destroying land and property. Mm -hmm. and that's kind of, that's, that's a general description of that. So water management is, is about just managing uh, our most important natural resource. Other than air, water is everything. <laughs> without water, we, we do not survive. Yeah, that's great. So um, the significance of it is related to the economy, right? You said it. We without water, we're not surviving. Our crops aren't growing. Things aren't moving forward. Um, what are some of the uh, economic impacts when you're talking about water management? Maybe more specifically, you know, you got state, local, national, all these different regulations that are piling on top of it that want to have their two cents about how to do it, what not to do, how to manage it properly. Um, talk about how the economy in general and the, and the uh, policy kind of impact the, uh, the water management. Well, I'm going to give uh, an example that your viewers will relate to. And we're going to talk more about the Ogallala Aquifer, which uh, is underneath seven states, and that is South Dakota, Wyoming, Nebraska, Colorado, Kansas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and Texas. And uh, that area irrigates uh, a large percentage of our crops in the United States and the world. Mm -hmm. $20 billion worth of food is produced from that area. Now, so if you take that away, just think what you do to the economy right there. You've depleted $20 billion worth of gross domestic product. So that's the economic impact. It also destroy the communities and lives of people in all those states. 
So that's just an example of that. And the Ogallala is the largest aquifer in the United States. There are other aquifers around the world that are bigger than that. But that's probably the most critical one that, that we're faced with today is what happens if we lose the water from that aquifer. Mm -hmm. So for perspective, um, and obviously you named all the states it's involved with, but you know, how big is it? I don't know if there's uh, the unit of measure. Yeah, 174,000 square miles. 174,000 square miles. If you took the water from that aquifer and it was one and a half foot deep, it would cover the United States. Just take it and put a, a foot and a half of water, it would cover the United States. That kind of puts it in perspective for you. Right, absolutely. And how, I'm asking some pretty, uh, you know, elementary type questions, but so uh, how full is it, right? And I'm not sure if that's the, the right term, but if you talk about depletion and um, where do we stand right now in 2020? You, you've defined how big it is, where, where do we well, stand and how much is there? I'll put it into perspective from this standpoint. In, in 2013, it was predicted if we continued to use water at the rate that we're using now, irrigating out of that, and also for municipalities, it's not just purely agriculture. Mm -hmm. But by 2063, it would be 70% depleted. So within 100 years, uh, it'll all be gone mm -hmm. if, if, if we don't conserve that water. Right, right. What other, uh, you mentioned there's a handful of basins across the, across the U.S. We'll kind of get back into our local region here, but what other type of basins are in the U.S. and, and are they of similar size and I don't want to say depletion level, but um, maybe you could talk about that. Well, I'm, I'm really not that familiar with other aquifers in, in the U.S. Uh, you get outside of the high plains and most people are really depending on surface water rivers, lakes, irrigating from that, just natural rainfall. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes the high plains interesting is if you look at old maps, the area between, oh, roughly Kansas City to the Front Range was described as the Great American Desert. That's what it's described as. That area is really in a state of constant drought with periodic rain events. And uh, if you get over the Oh, get west out towards Flagler, Colorado. We have a client there, Flagler Co-op that we're dealing with. Those people have been in a severe drought for, oh, the last couple of years. But that's kind of a perpetual thing. And if you look at Colorado, the Colorado River provides, oh gosh, I don't know what percentage of the water, but all the way to the west coast. So that's critical. You all are kind of ground zero for where water is because it flows from both sides of the mountains. Mm-hmm, yeah. You know, the date that you'd mentioned, uh, 2063, it's far enough out, but if you blink your eyes, it's really not that far. And, and you know, that's significant and, and the depletion is going to be, uh, be very, very impactful. Um, I want to jump into a, a, a film that you produced um, a while back that was very interesting that addressed this, right? And we always like to have examples and real world scenarios with Uptime Logistics. And I think this is the perfect transition to go into the program that you had put together and the, and the 50 year water vision for the state of Kansas. Now, I know it's not your vision, the state of Kansas had this vision, but you know, you know a lot about it, you help consult with it. And I'd like to kind of walk through, spend the next uh, bit of time kind of walking through what that is, the pros and the cons, how people work together, and some really cool tangible things that have come out of it. So before we dive into that, maybe you could kind of explain what is the 50-year water vision uh, for the state of Kansas and how this came, came about. Well, okay, I'll give you a little bit of the background. Mm -hmm. I think it was back in 2012 or 13. I was in Dodge City, Kansas. I had a lot of clients that I worked with out in uh, Southwest Kansas. And I met the producer of a documentary called The Great American Wheat Harvest. And it was really interesting. And I asked him, I said, well, what's your next topic that you're thinking about doing? He says, well, I'm thinking about doing something about water. And I said, well, if you do, I said, I want you to come spend a week with me. And I'm going to take you around and introduce you to my clients. I was working with an irrigation company, uh, with a, an ethanol producer, many large farming operations. And uh, he had never been around that large scale irrigation before. So after we did that, he produced uh, um, documentary called Thirsty Land. Well, I was the associate producer and I found out what an associate producer is, is you raise money for the film. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And, 
and I was involved in, you know, I, I had a lot of people that uh, I, I wanted him to interview and some of them ended up in the movie. So in doing all this, working with all these clients, uh, the state of Kansas, the Kansas Water Office and the Department of Agriculture came to me and said, Jim, you know, we would like to have a documentary on uh, Governor Sam Brownback's 50 year water vision. And uh, since now I'm an associate producer, of course, I know how to, <laughs> I know how to produce a film. Yeah. And that's what we did. So, you know, I trekked all around the, the country with a, a cameraman and we started documenting what this 50 year water vision was like. And why this is so critical is by the year 2050, we're going to have a population of about 9 billion people in the world. That means we're going to have to double food production to feed those people. Now get your mind wrapped around that. Double food production mm -hmm. to, to feed these people. At the same time, we're depleting the Ogallala aquifer and 70% of it's going to be gone by about the same time. So something drastic had to happen. Mm -hmm. And the governor, what he did is he issued this challenge. I want you to come up, Kansas Water Office, Department of Agriculture, and all of the agencies involved with water in the state of Kansas to come up with a 50-year water vision. So what they did is they created a, a blue ribbon commission, got all these people involved. And this is probably the greatest example of a private public collaboration that I've ever seen. So instead of dictating to people what to do, they created uh, what they call the regional action committees. I think that's right, RACs. And when they put out the call for people that wanted to be involved, 300 people responded. And they ended up with 14 of these uh, mm -hmm. regional action committees. And I think about 150, 160 people participated in it. And they established all of the goals for this. And some of the really cool things that came out of it was they, they created what we call uh, water conservation areas. And that is where if you're a landowner and you have uh, the water rights, and this is in the state of Kansas, and your water rights are tied to the wells that you're using, you're restricted about how much water you can pump and where that water goes. Mm -hmm. But the water conservation areas gave those farmers some latitude in how they could use that water, they could move it around, if they agreed to cutting back the amount of water that they pumped. Now this is a big deal because if you talk to anybody that farms, one of the things they do not want is somebody telling them what to do with their water. That's their water, they want to use it. And particularly if you're raising a, a crop like corn, um, it's very sensitive to water. So if you cut back on that, it can really hurt your yield. But the water conservation areas gave some of those, well, it gave anybody that wanted to participate the ability to say, okay, I'm going to cut back 30%, maybe 50% over the next three years, five years, or, or whatever. Uh, the other thing that they did that was really interested, and, and I had clients who were involved, is we created what we called water technology farms. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea of the water technology farms was to demonstrate new technologies that would conserve water. And we came up with, uh, I shouldn't say we, but I mean the people that really designed this, they came up with uh, some really cool technologies that were being tested and implemented. And uh, I can tell you a little bit about some of those if you want me to go into that or we can yeah. move on to something else. Yeah, a couple, absolutely. Cause that, I think those are, that's the tangible, you know, uh, takeaways that our audience would definitely want to hear. But before we do that, um, so on the water conservation farms, right? You said that the farmers out there could raise their hand and say, I want to be part of, of the mm -hmm. mission here. So I, um, I didn't quite understand or didn't hear you. Like what was the win for the farmer? Right, so I'm going to jump in here and and be part of this. And and uh, was was it just a simple fact that you want to? Everybody's on the right mission to try to save water, or was there tax incentives that the farmers got? Talk a little yeah. bit. Yeah, well, that's that's one. Is the the thing is is the people that really wanted to be involved, they realized that my farm is going to be worthless if I don't have any water. So let's just say that you've bought irrigated ground, and you paid let's say three thousand dollars an acre for it. Well, if there's no water there anymore, that may be worth $700 an acre. Mm -hmm. That may be depleted in 20 years. It may be depleted in, in 30 years. But you have paid for a resource that you have to earn a return on your investment, or your investment is no good. And it was estimated that if we didn't uh, do something, and the state of Kansas 
40% of the land would be reverted back to dry land crops or just pasture land. So it, it would, I'm not gonna say it'd be worthless, but it would be back to what it looked like in the 1800s. Right. So th the idea was, is okay, we're gonna let you tell us how much you wanna cut back. And because you're doing that, we're gonna let you take water from one well where you may have really good water. And we're gonna let you move that to another field where you may not have a good well. So it let them take those resources, resources that they were restricted to by their water allotment and they couldn't pump it and let them be more judicious and more uh, maximize the use of that water somewhere else. Does that make any sense? Oh, it's, yeah, definitely. It definitely makes sense. And that kind of gets into the, the water rights and all that stuff. That's a whole nother conversation that we have. So it does make sense. And um, the film, I was able to take a, a look at that the other day. And, you know, one thing that resonated on every single farmer with these uh, conservation farms is they always spoke about the future generation. I'm a third generation. My son's a farmer. So the fact that, every, that um, they get it, right? It's not just the here and the now. You can't look 15 feet in front of you. You got to look 50 feet ahead of you. So I totally get it when it's like, what's in it for the farmer? It's for healthy land and a secured future for their family. So it um, makes, makes complete sense. Well, so, go ahead. Yep. Uh, uh, well, another thing they had was, and these were actually prior to the, uh, the 50 year water vision was what we call local enhanced management areas. Mm -hmm. And that would be in a groundwater district or a defined area where a group of landowners would get together and they would say, okay, we're going to, as a group, restrict how much water we're going to pump. And it's a pretty big deal because you got to get them all together. They all got to agree and it's binding. It's legally binding. And one of the great success stories was up in Northwest Kansas in the uh, Sheridan Six groundwater district. Mm -hmm. That group got together. They decided that they would agree to a 20% cutback, which is a huge cutback on water. And as a result of that, the aquifer came up. It started coming back up. Well, this had never happened in decades. So they proved that you could recharge the aquifer locally. It wasn't, you know, in general, but in a specific area. And the cool thing about it, when they did that, they realized, wait a minute, we can grow just as good of crops get just as good a yields and use a lot less water. Mm -hmm. Most farmers will overuse or over pump because the fear that if I don't keep pumping water on that, I'm going to lose my yield on my crop. So it was a real success story. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that uh, the farmers in different lands uh, were able to collaborate and, and, you know, do something on a larger scale. I think that was, uh, that was pretty impressive. So we saw, we talked real briefly about the benefit of it, right? They were able to, to have mm -hmm. the aquifer gain back. They were able to use 20% less water and have no negative impact to their crop. What are some of the specific things that they did? You made mention of that a few minutes ago about, you know, here's the different um, tactics that they use, maybe some different technologies or some different equipment. Maybe you can get into that. I know um, one that I heard about was dragon lines, right? Yeah. And I was like, okay, I don't even know what that is. Did some research and it looks, looks pretty cool. So maybe you talk about the Dragon lines, how that impacts fertilizer use, things of that nature. Well, Dragon Line was developed by a friend and client of mine, Monty Teeter, Teeter Irrigation in Southwest Kansas. And if, if you'd go back to Southwest Kansas or really anywhere in the High Plains when they irrigated prior to what we called center pivot irrigation, you know, those circles that we see when we oh, plant yeah. in our yeah. plant. It was all uh, flood irrigation, which is extremely inefficient. You lose a lot of water by doing that. Well, then they went to pivots and they put these high pressure nozzles on these pivots and they made the circles. They went around and around, shot the water up in the air. Probably 70 to 80% of it was just lost to evaporation <laughs> as you're shooting it up in the air. Mm -hmm. Then they, they came up with the concept of what if we don't shoot it up in the air, but we actually put what we call drops on those pivots and we applied the water closer to the ground, which is an improvement there. Well, then finally, and, and the most efficient way to apply water is what we call subsurface drip irrigation. So you actually put the, the water <clears throat> lines underneath the ground and through capillary action, it perks up and covers the field. Most efficient way that you can irrigate. Mm -hmm. Well, Monty Teeter came up with the idea, what if we combine those two things? So instead of having the regular drops, what he did was he took drip pipe, where he, which you would use underneath underground, and attach those to those 
drops. And of course you have to do a lot of measurements to get this right. And now you're applying water with the same concept of drip irrigation on a center pivot. Hmm. Well, the results were phenomenal. It would save at least 30% uh, through the application of your water. And if you think about saving 30% of your water, that's a huge savings. But the other thing was, it was in a more efficient use of, of the water. And uh, that was probably, that's probably one of the biggest things that I've seen technology-wise in irrigation in my lifetime, anyway. Yeah. So the water technology farms, they started testing these so that they could validate that. Well, they came up with a whole bunch of other side benefits, like you could use less fertilizer because you leach out fertilizer when you apply too much water to it. So you're applying less water, using less fertilizer, you have less wear and tear on the machinery because they're not pulling so hard as, as the wheels are moving through the field. And it also solved another problem for them. People don't realize it whenever they see these center pivots, but they get stuck mm -hmm. out in the field. Well, that's why farmers don't want to turn their pivots off. They'll keep watering even when they don't need the water because they don't want to get their pivot stuck. Well, they found out that it also took care of what we call wheel track issues. So the wheels don't get stuck. So the benefit is, is it's not only saving water, but it's also a great management tool for the farmer as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that, that's probably one of the biggest technologies that were tested in the water technology farms. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. There's kind of indirect or unintended consequences in a positive way that came out of meeting the fertilizer and, and the equipment not being uh, so much wear and tear. Uh, one thing I had read about was the uh, telemetics and kind of the technology. The, to, to the telemetry. Yeah, the, it's, it's kind of cool. There's telemetry. Yeah. You know, we always remember the commercial. We've got an app for that. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's an app that you can use to actually run your center pivot irrigation. You can stop it. You can start it. You can see how much water it's being pumped. And you can do it all with your phone. And so that was another technology that was being tested. And these have all been validated since as a result of that. Uh, the other thing is, is the use of what we call moisture probes that you actually can put at different places in the field and it measures the water profile. So you know exactly how much water you have in the ground. You can look at that and you can say, hey, I, my profile's full. I don't need to pump. Mm -hmm. So you get on your app, you stop your pivot, you keep reading your, your moisture probe and it tells you whether you need to water or not. So it's, it's really, it's, it's cool technology. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So one thing uh, that was discussed when I read over the, the water vision was uh, water reclamation uh, and remediation. I know that was, was, was part of it, right? So we're pulling uh, water out of the ground and we're using it immediately, but there's a lot of wastewater um, and things you could do to recycle, you know, reduce, reuse, and recycle uh, water. Um, did that get involved with the, with the plan? And tell us a little bit about how, you know, how that related and who was in charge of that aspect of the remediation of used water. Well, there are several agencies that were involved in all this, and it would be the Kansas Water Office, it would be Kansas Water Authority, which worked hand in hand together, uh, the Kansas Geological Survey. And so what they're all doing is trying to figure out, okay, what is the quality of the water in these various areas. Uh, there is another uh, aquifer over more in central eastern Kansas, it's the Equus Beds, and it's a shallower aquifer over there. But because of you know, past use of uh, chemicals, some of that had been uh, contaminated. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of water in the world that's not usable because it's been contaminated. And this is particularly true in the oil field. You know, we, we end up using salt water in, or water to inject for fracking. And that water is called produced water. Well, once it's used, it has to be disposed of. So trying to figure out, well, we're pumping all this water in the salt water disposal wells. Can it be reclaimed? And there was actually, and there's been a lot of research done on this, and it's, it's still a long ways from being fully developed. But if we could reclaim all of that water, then that could be used for irrigation for agricultural use. Hmm. That's interesting. And you say that that um, discussion and analysis and research on reclamation and reusing it is still pretty new in the process, or has that um, matured a little bit on here's exactly what we're going to do to get this reclamated water back in the field? Well, 
I'd say it's still in the, in the research and development stage. Mm -hmm. uh, part of it is, yes, it can be done, but is it commercially viable? Mm -hmm. You know, can, can you make it pay? Uh, and I think that we're going to get there with it. It's kind of like, uh, you know, taking seawater and, and pulling desalinization plants they have out on the West Coast. They have them out there. It's just a balance of, is it commercially viable? Can you, yeah. does, does it pay? Yeah. And eventually what's going to happen, because water is such a, uh, you know, it is the most critical natural resource that we have. It, we'll be doing more of those things in the future when people wake up to the fact that the biggest crisis in the world isn't climate change or global warming, it's water. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any difference about anything else without that water. So that's, I think that's really the, the cool thing. And there's a lot of ongoing research. How do we reclaim water? Uh, but you never hear about it, Doug, in the media. Mm -hmm. When was the last time that you heard the media talk about water uh, when there wasn't a drought? Very, very rarely, unless there's some type of uh, tropical storm or something negatively, the water's negatively impacting something in, in the world. But you're right. And see, people don't ever think about water unless they go to the sink and they turn on the faucet and it's not there. And it's like, what happened? Yeah. So I, I think probably one of the, the biggest bottom line benefits of the 50 year water vision in the state of Kansas is the fact that they got people to thinking about how do we conserve this natural resource that we can't live without. And through a whole lot of initiatives, through education and bringing everyone together and even bringing states together because they have uh, the Republican River Compact. Republican River provides water in three different states, Colorado, Nebraska, and Kansas. Well, up until this, most of the conversations between those three, three seats were done in the courtroom. You know, they're, yeah. they're, it's all about a legal battle just like we talked about like Colorado and Utah. Well, that changed because what they did is they said, look, it's all the, the you know, water doesn't know boundaries. They don't understand the difference between Colorado and Kansas. So what are we gonna do that we can ensure that our citizens in each of our states are going to get the water that they're owed legally and they can use it beneficially? And the other thing that came out of that compact was there's water use is different at different times in different places. So when do we use the water to make maximum use of, of this resource? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you kind of nailed it in talking about the conservation and the protection. You know, protection is this is mine. Don't take it. I'm allocated this amount and that's more legal battles. And that's where you get into the water rights. It's my right. I'm going to protect it. But the 50 year vision is more about con con uh, conservation. And this is all of our water, regardless of bounds. And if we stay in protection mode, fast forward to 2063, and we're all gonna be in a world of hurt. So to have that mindset, you know, that, that uh, paradigm shift from don't mess with my water, I'm protecting it to let's figure out a way together to conserve it. Um, that's a real paradigm shift that I'm hearing you talk about. It was a recurring theme when I'd interview people all across the state. It didn't make any difference whether it was in Eastern Kansas or whether it was Western Kansas. Uh, they all said the same thing. We have to change the culture to a culture of conservation, not a, a, a culture of it's mine and I'm going to use it. Mm -hmm. it. It's not just about me and my water. It's about what do we have to do collectively to ensure that this resource is going to be here for the future generations. So I, I think that was one of the, the best things about producing that film was to hear people actually say it, we have to partner if we're going to make this thing work. Yeah, no, I, I agree. You nailed it. So we've been talking about the film. If, if folks that are listening want to, to actually watch the film, what's the best way for them to, to access the, I guess like a 30 minute video we looked at. So if I want to uh, learn more, how do I find it? Well, I tell you what, the best way to do it is just Google Kansas water office. And what you'll do is you'll be directed to the Kansas Water Office website. And then you want to look at the, uh, the Water Vision tab. Click on that and you'll get to watch the film. And it's really kind of a cool film. You got to see it mm -hmm. because it takes place uh, from the perspective of it, the years 2063. Yeah. And then you get to hear 
what happened in the last 50 years to make sure that the, the, the state of water in the state of Kansas was not only preserved, but enhanced. Yeah. yeah. No, I would encourage the audience to go and, and look at it. I was a little apprehensive. I'm like, okay, 30 minutes about water, but once you get into it, I, was, uh, I thought it was great, and I appreciate you uh, producing it. Uh, I guess assistant producer, because you had to find all, raise all the money, right? Now that I know what I see. <laughs> Well, actually, on that on that project, I was the I was the producer, the director, and I didn't have an associate producer, so I had to do that too. <laughs> I did everything on that. You did it all. That's great. Well, I got to give Kansas a little bit of a thumbs up. I grew up in Wichita, so it's it's good to see that Kansas is kind of leading the charge on the conservation versus uh, protection aspect of it. And I, I can't thank you enough, Jim, for for coming on on board to uptime and helping us understand what's going out there. Uh, what's the deal with water? It's kind of what we spoke about, so. Well, and, and I'll say this, uh, I'm a native Oklahoman. Uh, I live in Oklahoma now. I've spent a lot of time in the past living in Kansas as well. But I, I really look at Kansas and see they are doing what all states should be doing. Every state needs to have a 50 year water vision. They need to bring together all of the parties. I mean, in this case, we brought together agriculture, industry. Uh, you remember you saw a little bit of there about oxy dental chemical mm -hmm. corporation in Wichita. They invested a million dollars in their plant to reclaim water, to reuse it, reduce their water usage by 40%. They did that voluntarily. They didn't do it because the EPA came in and said, you've got to do this. That's really exciting whenever you see people from all aspects, every venue, agriculture, industry, municipalities. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in Garden City, Kansas, the Dairy Farmers of America put in a uh, milk plant there to produce powdered milk. They took all the water they pulled out of that milk and they gave it to the city of Garden City mm -hmm. to reuse. That, that's just a cool success story. Yeah. So, they, they didn't have to do that, but they partnered with the city. Yeah. Yeah. Those are great, great stories. So um, again, I'd like to thank you for, for uh, coming on. It's been great. I'm glad you gave us a link and understood how to get to your film. I think it'll be very, very interesting. And I'd also like to thank our audience today for joining us on uh, Uptime Logistics. Of course, it's powered by Cap Logistics. You can find more information on the show at the description below. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. And uh, of course, please visit caplogistics.com for all of your transportation needs. So until we meet again, thanks for joining the Uptime Logistics program. Have a great day.